Hey there, my name is Mike Joseph. I host and produce Detoxicity, which is the podcast that you were just about to listen to. I hope that you have been listening and enjoying uh, for the entire time that we've been doing this. If you are new, welcome. If you are a listener of long standing, welcome again and thank you. Um, I appreciate the fact that you listen to this podcast. If you listen and enjoy, please feel free to leave a comment. Please feel free to rate on iTunes or any other podcast platforms that have the ability to rate. And please subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. Also, I would love it. It's not a requirement, but I would love it if you followed me on social media. I am on Twitter at TizMikeJoseph. That is T-I-S-M-I-K-E-J-O-S-E-P-H. And I'm on Instagram at DetoxPodGuy. I don't need to spell that out for anybody. I'm also on Tik... I'm not on TikTok. But you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. And if you would like to be on the show, or you know somebody who'd be a good fit for an interview on the show, feel free to reach out to me via either of those two platforms, or you can drop me an old-fashioned email, detoxpod at gmail.com. Once again, that is detoxpod at gmail.com. Again, thank you for listening. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy. For this episode, I had the privilege of talking to writer, director, and author John Callis. Over four decades in the entertainment business, John has worked with A-list actors, directed over 80 episodes of the classic animated series Bobby's World, and won a VMA for Best Concept Video for Glenn Fry's Smuggler's Blues. John recently published a memoir called When the Rain Stops, in which he discusses his hard scrabble childhood, the loss of his father at a very young age, and the circumstances that ultimately led to a stint in military school. This forms the basis of our conversation, and we travel from past to present with John, tracing his career in the entertainment industry, his relationship with the higher power, the secret to a long-lasting marriage, the power of forgiveness, and so much more. I am proud to present to you my conversation with John Callis. Well, first, Mike, thanks for having me on your show. My name's John Callis. I've been in the film business for over 40 years as a director, writer, producer, and also I'm a novelist as well. What attracted me to your show is I, I really appreciate what you're doing about helping people that suffer from depression, anxiety, and what that looks like and what it takes to get out of it. Well, I'm glad you're here and I, I'm glad that you're interested in these topics and you're willing to talk about them. I, I do want to ask before anything, how did you get involved in, in the film industry? Well, it started with my master's degree at Occidental College. Actually, just rewind for a second, Mike. I started out college as a chemistry major because my dad died 10 days after my third birthday, which is wow. in my memoir. Right. And I lost all my faith in God. I lost all my faith in humanity. I hated everybody, hated everything, and became a pretty bad problem child. And so off I went to military school at the age of 12 by myself. And from there, the trauma was just built. So to answer your question, when I got to my master's degree, I went to a, a restaurant one night and I knew I wanted to transition from theater arts into film in real life because theater in California is really non-existent or it's not a, much of a moneymaker. And I was sitting there and this guy dressed in white, bald-headed guy was sitting there and people were kind of pointing and laughing. And I looked over and he looked at me and I smiled and waved. And I went back to doing my master's degree and he came and sat next to me. And we started chatting. I told him what I was doing. He wanted to come see the play, which, of course, I let him. Um, and for about six months, we became friends. I never asked him what he did. And he finally said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'm trying to get in the film business. And, you know, it's really tough. I don't, I don't have any contacts. And, you know, I'm beating the pavement like everybody. And it's not easy. I said, well, what do you do? And he said, I'm an art director in the film business. <laughs> I went, no shit, really? I said, look, if there's ever a chance I can get on a set with you, I would really appreciate it. So sure enough, three o'clock in the morning, one morning he calls and says, what are you doing? Sleeping? I mean, what else am I doing? At yeah. The he says, well, get dressed. Uh, I'm picking you up in 15 minutes. And he took me to a set. He said, you stand here. Nobody will bother you. If they do, just tell him John said it's okay to stand here. About 10, 15 minutes later, this crumply old guy comes walking up to me and goes, what are you doing here? I said, I'm just watching. He goes, well, you come with me. So I thought I was getting thrown off my first set. He takes me in his van and he has me starting to wrap this cord with tape. I said, what is this stuff? He goes, it's primer cord. I said, what's that? He goes, it's an explosive. I drop and I jump out of the van. I said, are you out of your mind? I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, no. And he's putting fire under it. He said, you got to set it off with, I said, okay. So I go back in. He said, but the stuff you're sitting on is dangerous. I said, what's that? He goes, gunpowder. Again, out the door. <laughs> so, 
So wow. it turned out this guy's name was Harry Wallman, and he was, his background so extensive. I mean, he worked with Clark Gable, all sorts of people. And he took me under his wing for a couple of years as a special effects assistant. So I got to blow up people's brains, shoot them in the head, and all sorts of fun stuff. And then from there, I, I just started working my way through it. And then after about a year or two, it all went dry. So I took a waiter job. And a production manager friend of mine walks in and starts laughing and going, what are you doing as a waiter? I said, well, again, you dried up. I'm looking for work. And he goes, well, I'm starting a picture in next week. Are you available as a prop man? And I said, let me just check my schedule. Yeah, I am. <laughs> and, uh, so, so we did that. And then I got a job as an assistant director. And it just kind of blossomed from there. Wow. wow. And you've done all sorts of stuff from video direction to film direction. Now you're, you, you've written a memoir. What was the catalyst to get you to write about yourself? Well, a lot of it was being cathartic with my mother. I had a really strained relationship with her. And later on in life, we came to an understanding. And I had to start thinking about all the stuff I put her through, not what she put me through. And then when I became a parent, I truly understood her mindset. I mean, to be honest with you, I was completely out of control. I had no father, no guidance, getting in a lot of trouble. And I was right down the, the uh, rabbit hole into depression and an attempted suicide when I was in, in uh, 10th grade. And I thought, there are a lot of people out there suffering. And I don't think men, especially men, talk about it much. Because we've always been brought up, you know, we're tough. We're not supposed to cry. We're men. Sure. Yep. And I thought, I'm going to write this story. So I started writing it and I showed my friend uh, David and my wife, Linda, uh, a brief copy. And they both started yelling at me. I said, what are you guys yelling at me for? They said, you're writing this as if it's some other character. I said, well, yeah, I'm just trying to make it a character. He goes, no, this is your life story. All of this stuff really happened to you. I said, yeah, it did. And, and they said, what are you afraid of? And I said, fear, that's a good one. I was scared to death to expose my underbelly. And then I started thinking about it. And I said, if I don't do this, I'm gonna be forever chained to all these memories. And if I truly wanna be of the world and of humanity, I've gotta share this and hopefully somebody else will get out of something out of it. And as I say in my book, if I, if I save one person's life, I'll consider it a bestseller. Because I think it's that. kind of yeah. Absolutely. How can you remember, because you were so young, losing your dad? Like, is it a memory that is still kind of prominent in, in your head? Because I think for some people, they're so young when something like that happens that they don't really fully grasp it or remember it. Actually, I remember two things. I remember 10 days after your third birthday, you don't have, as you rightfully point out, you don't have a lot of memory. But I remember him holding a sheet up in the air with my mother behind it. He played magic tricks. Mm -hmm. And he went, abracadabra, boom, dropped the sheet and she was gone. And we're running around the apartment, a small apartment, trying to find it. I walk in the bathroom and I think, mm, it's only so many places you can hide. And I was about to pull the door and he goes, why would she be hiding behind a door? She was hiding behind a <laughs> door. <laughs> so that went on. The second memory is going to the hospital and seeing him incredibly frail. I mean, nothing left on his bones, but it was my birthday and he refused to be in the depressed state of I'm dying. And instead he gave me a German shepherd that he got permission from the, the army to get out of the service. And he gave me the dog that he had in World War II. Wow. And yeah, it was a monumental moment in my life. And then after that, I just remember my mother telling me he died and I fell apart. I just became impossible. Can you, at this point, make sense out of what it was that made you impossible? Was it just not having a father around? Was it anger at the world at having lost him? Was it maybe not grasping the concept of what death was? Like, what was it that really kind of put you in a direction of, I'm just going to be a troublemaker? I think it's a great question. I think the trigger point was the abandonment issue. I felt he left me. And Nobody was telling me the truth, so I started making up all these fantasies that he was still on a mission someplace, a secret agent of some sort, and I got really depressed thinking all the kids were telling me, well, this weekend I'm going to have a, to a baseball game with my dad, what are you doing? And I'd make up stories, oh, well, we're, we're going hiking in the woods, we're going camping, and 
it, it just put me into a spiral. I told one lie after another, and I got so mad. We were in a very economically challenged neighborhood, we'll say it like that. And so I started hanging out with the wrong kids and we got into a lot of trouble, you know, a lot of fighting. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I lost my faith in God, didn't trust anybody. I thought the world was all lying to me. Sure. Uh, my dad was still alive. He couldn't have died. And when I slowly came to grips with it, I, I just got really angry and uh, depressed and it just went from there. And it, it, it looks like at some point your mom kind of threw her hands up and was like, let's get this kid off to military school. And that doesn't really seem to have changed things very much. You mean you think I'm still getting in trouble? I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't imagine that kind of environment is good for someone who doesn't have trust in people or doesn't have faith in people. And then there's also, and this is just me, making assumptions here, got to be a sense of double abandonment. It was double abandonment because the image of me, well, my mother, let, let's back up. The reason I was sent to military school, when you said she threw her hands up, that's partially true, but the courts gave her a decision. Either I went to military school or they were going to send me to reform school because it was just not going to happen. So by this time, she was dating a guy who became my stepdad eventually and Believe me, I love this man to the ends of the earth. They're both past, but he was what I always wanted, but it was a little late in life. Sure. And so she put me in a car in New Jersey, drove across the George Washington Bridge, went to Penn Station and put me on the train and said goodbye. And I had to go from New Jersey to Virginia by myself as a 12-year-old kid. And I don't think I've ever been that scared in my life. And that just crumpled more abandonment issues. I thought, okay, she's sending me away because she wants to be with this new boyfriend. Um, she doesn't love me or she wouldn't do this to me. I'm now all alone. So I have no guidance, nobody to do. And the first thing I do, I get in a fight with one of the cadets on the uh, train because he said, your mom gave me money to look after you. And, and he says, I said, well, who, who gives a shit? Who are you anyway? He says, so you're a tough guy, huh? I said, no, you look more like an asshole. And that was it. Boom. <laughs> so... Yeah, we got a big fight. I wound up in the middle of the train cars, smoking one cigarette after another till I threw up the last bit of my breakfast out the window. And then I found somebody to buy me beer and I got drunk and it was not good. Abandonment started horrible. The trauma started piling on. And yeah, I just felt like it was me against the world. And I, I actually tempted myself to jump off the train and try to find some place to live, even if it was in a cardboard box. That's how scared and terrified. Worst three years of my life. It was not a fun experience. It did, if there was going to be a silver lining, it did give me a sense of how to be disciplined when I wanted to, not because I was told to. So that carried me pretty well through life. So it did keep me away from trouble. And then when I finally got out of there after three years, because I told my parents, I'm going to kill myself if you send me back. And they knew I meant it. They put me in a private school. And the first day, the six foot tall guy comes up and says, I hear you went to military school. I said, yeah, I did. He goes, stand up and kill me. And I'm like, oh, shit, is this going to start all over again? And by that time, I was really involved in the peace movement. I didn't want anything to do with fighting. For three years, he spit in my face, pushed me, called me a greasy Greek, all this stuff, trying to push me and push me and push me. And it, it got really, really horrible, which I, ex I explained in the book. Then the soccer coach came to me and said, why don't you join the soccer team? I said, coach, I, I'll be honest with you. I never had a father. I don't play sports and, and none of that stuff appeals to me. Well, he convinced me to, to play soccer. And third year there, it was nomination time for captain. And so my name was put forth and this guy stood up and said, why should we nominate him? He won't even stand up for himself. And I snapped. I said, anytime, asshole, anytime. And he said, right now. And he punched me, got up, punched me again, got up, punched me again, got up. And I kicked him square in the nuts. He went down. Yeah, he went down, I grabbed his eyes. I was trying to rip his eyes out of his head. And the coach tried to grab me and I whack, knocked him over. And the whole team had to get me off of him. And I went back to my dorm and I thought, oh boy, I'm doomed. I'm really doomed. And the coach came down. I said, coach, I'm really sorry. Because no, no, it's okay. The whole team wants you back on the field and you've been unanimously voted co-captain of the team. I said, unanimous? He goes, yeah, even... And the headmaster of the school calls me in his uh, office and I thought, oh crap, I'm gonna get in trouble. 
I walked in, I said, look, I've been telling you for years, if I snap, he goes, no, no, I saw the whole thing. I was there rooting for you. I wanted you to punch him again for me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, at that point, I thought the world is completely crazy. I, this is just a nuts freaking planet we're on. And I have to find a better way to make my life happen and not be in this mindset anymore because none of it made sense. Right. Here we are in 2021. And I feel like kids that are growing up now that might be in your situation or a situation similar to yours have more access to things that yeah. can help them at an earlier age. I mean, which I think is the case in some cases is not the case in some, you know, economically disadvantaged cases. What do you think is the most positive change that has been made in like the acknowledgement and development of, of things like the trauma that you went through, like in the last, you know, couple of decades, what do you think has been the biggest advancement in terms of, of, of being able to acknowledge that stuff? I think you said it before when you said that there's more tools out there. There are people that are more qualified to help people. I think the generation isn't saying you're a man, you're not supposed to deal with your emotions. I think there was a, a paradigm shift where people were starting to tell their kids, it's okay to feel things. It's okay if you want to cry. It's, there's nothing wrong with feeling something inside of you. And, and I think because of, there was a lot of exposure, for example, you know, a long time ago, we called small people midgets, and that's really disrespectful. So because it was brought out to the forefront, people started saying, oh, I didn't realize calling a, a little person a midget is disrespectful. And I still think little person's wrong. In my opinion, they should just be people. People, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean if you're five foot, if you're six foot, you're still a person. You know, so it, it's, um, it's that kind of thinking that had to change. And, and fortunately it is. Now it's, the hard part is getting the person with depression to accept those tools and want to come forward and get help. That's the hard part. How did you end up eventually getting help? How did you sort of come to realize all of this stuff and then was like, okay, I got to make some changes in my life. I need to deal with this stuff that I've been through and make sense of it or try to make sense of it or at least get it out of my system so that it's not a part of me forever. What was the turning point? I think the turning point for me is I learned in, when I lived in Colorado how to meditate. And, and this guy named Mark O'Brien, which we called OB, um, became kind of a spiritual guide for me. And on a chessboard, he explained life and how it really functions. And he made me feel that it was okay to be where I was at and that I had to learn to forgive not the people that did me wrong, but I had to learn to forgive myself. And so that became a big turning point. And then when I got to LA, I, I continued trying to think out why I was feeling this way and all that. And it got to the point where I had too many questions and no answers, and I had no way to resolve it. So I sought a therapist. And uh, after the first session, I had the therapist on the couch because he was crying about my life. So I said, I, you know, I don't think this is going to be a good therapist for me. So I finally found a woman through a friend of mine who after several sessions convinced me to go to group therapy. And that scared the bejesus out of me because now I have to sit among strangers telling them how screwed up I was. So I listened and I, after hearing everybody's story, I felt, you know, I'm not so unique. Everyone in this room has pain, but they seem at ease talking about it. And I said, I don't know how to ask a question. And they all kind of gathered around and, you know, encouraged me to start talking and therapy was a big turning point for me. It's worked for me. It's worked for a lot of people. And one thing you just said that really sticks with me, I think about this often, is when you start talking about the things that you've been through or, or things about you that you feel are so unique, you talk about them in a group and that gives other people license to talk about those same things. And then you're like, okay, wait a minute. All this time, I thought I was the only alien uh, yeah. in the world who was going through this stuff or who felt this stuff, but it feels like just as many people feel that, that this way as don't. Like it, it's, it's uh, you know, there's certainly strength in numbers, but you don't know what the numbers are until you actually start talking about them. Yeah. And you discover you're not unique. You know, I always thought all my problems, they, they, nobody else has these kind of problems. 
and you find out some people have worse problems than yeah. you. Then you say, oh, maybe I'm not so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it gives you a sense of perspective. Right? It does. It does. And uh, the process of forgiving yourself, which I think is really important. What does that even entail? Some people might be thinking, maybe it's just like me writing in a journal, all the things that I've done and, and forgiving myself for that stuff. Some people might see it as like a meditation kind of thing where you just sort of have an inner dialogue with yourself. What does the forgiving yourself mean to you? Like, how do you go about that process? Well, I think you, you're right. There's no one process that can be for me i picked up the artist way which you're supposed to write three pages a day for i don't know 12 weeks or something a year later i was still doing it because you know it just i couldn't stop it and that kind of was a cathartic moment they said go back and read it well it's 20 years now i've never read it and i'm sure if i went back i would see a repetitive theme in there i think forgiveness boy that's a tough one i think what i'd like to do is explain a little bit about the comfort of depression. I, I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but depression can be a very safe haven for those who are depressed because it's familiar. It's a place where they're comfortable with because they got familiar and they feel safe there, even though they're depressed. In order to get out of that, you have to start getting out of your comfort zone. And the only way to get out of your comfort zone is to find the things that you're not acknowledging and start forgiving yourself for the position that you put yourself in. You know, the external forces in life weren't the only thing at play here. Yeah, you lost your dad. All right, a lot of people lost their dad. Some people got their dads killed in wars, you know. Uh, I don't know what's worse. You lose them early or you lose them after you knew them for 20 years. They're both incredibly painful. So I had to start figuring out how to forgive myself from all the things that I held resentment towards my mother, military school, the people that did me wrong. And once I was able to forgive them, then I was able to start healing. That bully I was telling you about in private school? Yeah. Uh, I won the second annual MTV award for Smuggler's Blues, Glenn Fry Smuggler's Blues, for best concept. And my girlfriend at the time and I were flying back to the East Coast to get the award, you know, to be part of MTV. And there's some idiot in the front screaming, you know, there's Bud's view, completely drunk on his ass. And I kept looking at him. And my girlfriend said, what are you looking at? I said, remember that jerk in private school? She said, yeah. I said, I think that's him. And I started getting out of my seat because I was ready. And she grabbed me and said, what are you going to do, beat up, beat up a drunk? So as the plane started deplaning, I went up to him. I said, is your name? And I don't want to mention his name for privacy because he passed away. And he stood up and, yeah, who are you? And I told him, my name's John Callis, the, the greasy Greek in private school. And he looked at me. We didn't like each other, did we? I said, actually, I still hate your fucking guts. And so <laughs> we, we left the plane and we're in the, the luggage, you know, baggage claim. And I look over it and I could just see he looked completely lost, like a puppy dog. Now, just to give you a little background, during the private school three years I was there, I used to pray to God every night saying, I hope you do something horrible to this guy so he can understand what he did to my life. And so I went up to him and I said, hey, I got to ask a question. What happened to you? I mean, you, you were an actor in a movie. I mean, you were confident. What happened? He goes, oh, I was engaged to get married. And two weeks before the marriage, she fell off a ladder and killed herself. Yeah. And right then I thought, did I kill her? Did God answer my prayers? And I... My eyes swelled up and I just put my arms around him. And I said, I am really sorry. And I said, I don't know if you can accept this, but I just want to say, I forgive you for everything we went through. And I gave him my card and I said, please get in touch. You never saw him again. But I found out, I think a year or two later, he had died. Wow. wow. So that, that's a tough thing to do, but you have to find those moments to grab and it starts to release a lot of crap in your body. That's pretty powerful. I, I, I'm almost speechless uh, after hearing that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Let's tell a joke. Lighten right, the yeah, yeah, lighten the mood up a little bit. You know, uh, what is it? Like one question I, I have almost whenever I talk to somebody is what are we so fucking afraid of? What I feel like fear rules so much of the shit that we do as people so much of it, like we're just ingrained with fear and i think 
like you don't live a full life unless you sort of get over the hump of some of the shit that you're scared of, whether it's stuff that's in you that you need to present to the world or stuff in relation to situations with other people. Or, I mean, it's a, a big world question, but what are we as humans, particularly as men, what are we as men so afraid of? That's a fantastic question. I've been recently trying to uh, develop that concept in my mind. And the best I've come up with is every one of us comes out of the womb and we come out clean, right? But before you even come out, there are certain things that you're already uh, marketed. You know, what language you're gonna speak, what culture you're gonna be under, what economic situation you're gonna live, what kind of education, all of that shit is laid out for you. And the minute you're out, everybody jumps on you not to try to seduce you into their path, but to scare you into their path. Mm. So everything, if you look at advertising, if you look at politics, it's all about fear. You know, if you don't take this pill, you're going to die tomorrow and your nose is going to fall off and you know, your left finger is going to go in your ear. And I mean, all of this shit is just compiled on us. And you're right. Men have always been told um, you have to be the breadwinner and all that. But nobody has ever taught us how to not be afraid of the world. The world's a scary place. I mean, the first question you look at as a kid, you go, where does the universe end? That just blows your fucking mind so big that there's no answer to that shit. So where do you go from there? If you can't figure that out, what do you do with that information? And then you start getting fearful. Well, am I going to make enough money so a woman will love me? So you get wrapped up thinking money is the key to your success that you love and all that. And that you discover is not true too. That love is the answer, not the money. Although look, I'm be the first one to admit money pays your bills and, and it gives you a good life. Yeah. It's the fear of failure. It's the fear of not being successful. It's the fear of never being married. It's the fear. It's the fear. Everything in life you've been told is based on fear. So once we understand that, I think we need to have education, a class about how not to be afraid, how to make sense of the world, life skills, like here's how you do dishes, guys. Here's how you do laundry. Here's how you make a meal. I mean, we get those experiences in, in school and then all of a sudden we're thrown out into the world and say, here, go make a success of yourself. Uh, women, on the other hand, are always under this insane pressure about being this perfect little ideal person. They have to be thin-waisted and perfect bodies and, and this and that and look like Barbie and all this kind of stuff. And oh, by the way, you must be an absolute virgin when you get married. Right. Then you get married and the first thing your parents say, I want grandkids. So wait a minute, I'm going from a virgin to a slut in one easy step. How does, I mean, come on, that's got to blow a woman's mind apart. You know, they have no sexual experience and no way to to be with a man. And that starts causing problems because usually by then men have sampled a lot of merchandise, so to speak. And that woman, if in true, in fact, she's a virgin, is scared of what this man's going to do to her because she's never had that experience. So and the first one's never comfortable. And so fear sets in there and then the relationship is built on fear. But it just gets so nuts. You just want to scream. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I do think that we grow up taught to be scared of everything from the very beginning. Fear of the world, fear of God, fear of other people, fear of people who are different from us. Exactly. Uh, and not to sound Pollyanna-ish, because I'm definitely not that kind of person, but you should be taught to kind of look at the world with wonder and look for the light in, yeah. in stuff. And I think that ultimately, I mean... It, Look, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, right? I know street smarts, but I don't think that the world in and of itself is like a dark, scary place. I think there are people that make it that way, but I think mm. there are also people working to make it a lighter, more more fun, more engaged, uh, better place, you know? Yeah, the arts, creative, anything, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, it's, it's a weird conundrum and I have a lot of experience and give a lot of thought to adjust to that non-fear-based way of thinking. But I, I think if you're gonna live a full life like that, that's what you gotta do. I'm not gonna oversimplify and say you gotta be sunny side up or glass half full all the time, but you gotta know that as much as there is bad, there is also good and you can be a part of, of, of the good. Yeah, which you know, wolf do you wanna feed? The fear or the good? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's a cliche, but it's true. John Lennon said it right when in an interview, he said, you know, the thing that you have to do is break out of the chains of what you were told. 
all prejudice, all fear of other cultures. It's all fear. I mean, this whole white supremacist thing that's going on in our country, they're, they're people who are scared to death of difference. They want it just the way it always has been, which is not right. And they're scared to let anything interfere with that into their lives. So it, I think it's important for us to recognize that prejudices and fear of other cultures, fear of the unknown or of things that you're not familiar with is what drives hatred. And until we get that under control, it will be continually taught in families. So we have to learn not to do that. I got to imagine like writing this book was super cathartic for you. That's got to be like a huge load off your shoulders. That's funny you brought that up because in order to write the book, I had to dig deep back into every experience and relive it. So there were times when my wife, Linda, would go by my office and I'd be typing, but crying like a baby. And she'd come over and she said, keep writing. And that's all she said and walked away. And it, it got to the point, it was so painful at times, I had to stop and walk away for a couple of weeks and then go back to it. And then when I was done with it, I handed it over to my friend who's an editor uh, and he edited the book. And the catharsis was amazing. I mean, sometimes when I look at the book cover, I, I go, I'm so glad I'm out of that. And I look at it and I say, I'm not going to deny it all happened. I'm not going to deny that's part of me and my past, but I'm not going to let that live inside of me anymore. And I'm not going to let it control me. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and so needed because I think a lot of people who are in situations where they're experiencing depression, particularly feel like it's never going to end. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's, that's a trap. Yeah. And it's important to know that there is a way out. There are multiple ways out if you want them, but that's super important to know. What do you do to take care of yourself? Well, I, I exercise, which is really good. I do a little meditating. I have a healthy, wonderful relationship with a woman that I swear I have, I never thought I would have. And every day I look at it, we just celebrate our 30th anniversary. Congratulations. And, thank you. And, you know, everyone, uh, I didn't think it would last more than six months, but um, you know, we have two great kids. I keep busy writing other stories. I mean, I'm working on my sixth novel now. I'm still active in the film business. I've, I'm developing three projects at the moment. So, so I think the key is to keep your mind occupied with things you love doing. And, and if you don't do that, then you're going to resent your life and resent those around you. You know, going to a job you hate every day. Yeah, look, I, I know the cliche as well. If you don't like it, just go find something you do like and go for it. Well, it ain't that easy. It, it ain't that easy. And, and, you know, there's practical things called paying your bills, putting food on the table. So a friend of mine reached out and he goes, I really want to write, but, I, you know, I'm stuck in this job. What do I do? I said, what time do you get up? He goes, well, it's like seven-ish. I said, get up at 5.30, take a shower, sit down and write from six to seven every morning for a month. And do, if you get three pages done in 30 minutes, walk away. If it takes you that hour, do the three pages, then walk away. He goes, well, what if I'm on a roll? I said, okay, you can write more, but don't put yourself under a pressure that it has to be X amount, but three pages gives you some benchmark to work towards. And he called me back and said, I've uh, been writing a lot. So about six months later, he had finished his book. Wow. Yeah, because he wanted to write and he didn't know how to do it. And I said, look, he said, well, I'm finding that I don't like some of the stuff I write. I said, welcome to the world. Keep writing. <laughs> don't bother trying to edit it. You know, get it, just spew it out on your paper, get it all done. And then the process starts at the rewrite, the rewrite, the rewrite, the rewrite, the rewrite. And then you send it to an editor and you rewrite it again. And that's, I think the key is just keep your mind occupied read books, do something that makes you happy for you. Take time, alone time, or with somebody if you want, but personal time that's selfish. You need to have that time for yourself. Otherwise you're gonna be useless to everybody, including yourself. I feel that a hundred percent. I gotta ask, what is the secret to a 30 year long happy marriage? Is there a secret? I believe there are several secrets. I will share them with you because uh, this may not work for everybody who watches this, but I think the first and foremost thing is communication. I know it sounds cliche-ish, but the truth is, is my wife and I've had some really uncomfortable, tough conversations that have strengthened us because we were honest with each other and didn't let the resentment. And I'll give you a quick example. 
after a second baby, um, I went to her and I sat her down and said, I, I need to talk to you. And she said, what's up? I said, I think you're a fantastic mother. I think everything you do is for your children. I wouldn't change anything. She goes, okay, what's the but? I said, I'm starting to look at other women. And she goes, why? I said, because I'm feeling not ignored, but I'm, I kind of feel left out. You know, you've got all your energy and I know it's exhausting. And I know at the end of the night, you just want to get in bed and fall asleep. And she goes, I'm really sorry. And we didn't talk about it after that. And things very quickly changed. And I felt very included. And I wish I hadn't because I had to start changing more diapers. But no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she went, you want to be part of it here. <laughs> be, be afraid of what you ask for. <laughs> but, you know, the, the love was there. It was just diverted to what was rightfully the focus, the kids. The second thing is that you're going to get a million people's advice. And it, it's good and bad. A woman once told me when you have a situation, and especially if it's kid advice and stuff, pretend you're on a deserted island and nobody's around you. What is the best thing for you and your family? Make that the decision, not what others or magazines or the news tells you how to live your life. That's important. I think when you argue, and you will argue, be very careful with your words because once they're out, you can't take them back. So if you find yourself, which Linda and I have come to this conclusion, so frustrated that you know you're about to say something really stupid, we say, I've got to walk away from this. Can we pick this up tomorrow? I need time to process. And I've done that a couple of times and I was thankful because I came back and said, you know, I wasn't willing to listen to your opinion about this because I was getting really pissed off. But after thinking about it, you were right. And she goes, I didn't mean to be right. I said, no, it's not about you being right, me being wrong. It's just, I wasn't ready to hear it. And I'm glad I took the time to think about it. The other thing is that, and I made this disclaimer. I said, if you ever play sexual games with me, I am not going to put up with it. You can't say, well, if you don't do this, you're not getting any. That's a game that's destined for disaster. And you're inviting your man to go out on you. Because we have drive, they have drives, you know, it's nothing different about the drive. But if you start playing that, you know, let's monetize my body to get you to do something. Also be friends, take each other out on dates, be friends, don't forget to play. Linda's biggest fear was when the kids grew up and left and we had an empty nest, were we still going to be able to be together? You know, were we still going to be friends and stuff? And she said that one night and I said, not only that, but once they're gone, we can travel a lot more. And she just cracked up lips. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because that's what I want to do too. And we have, we traveled a little. So it, look, 30 years of marriage is not easy. You know, it's, it, it has its challenges and people have said, well, what, what happens with the sex? I said, I'm going to be honest with you. At first it's great sex. You know, you're every place, at any time, anywhere. It's all right? new. It's all, there you go. It's all new. I said, 30 years later, you're no longer making love with each other uh, with the sparks but you're making love with a history of a life together. And to me, that's so much more valuable than getting laid by somebody. And then what do you talk about? You know, okay, yes, 25 year olds have great lift bodies and they're beautiful and all that, but there's no depth, there's no history. There's no, like we went through birth and deaths and movies and friends and travel. And we have things to talk about. So when we make love with each other, it's, it's all about the love of our lives together and respect. And if you respect each other, yeah, it's funny. I wrote 17 items and posted it a long time ago of what makes a 30 year marriage. And I wish I had it because I'd read it to you, but uh, <laughs> that, that's kind of the highlights of it. Those are you're dropping a lot of knowledge. I, I think a lot of people see long-term relationships and they're like, wow, how do I achieve that? And in addition to all that stuff, there's a chemistry that you have to continually work on. I, I think a lot of people do maybe miss the work part. They just think the spark that was there on day one is still going to be there in day 5,000 or day 10,000 or whatever, but yeah. we evolve as people. I, I have had friendships that have lasted for 15, 20 years and you have to grow together and remember the stuff that attracted you to that person in the first place but also acknowledge the fact that the other person is growing and you're growing with them and you're a little different than the person that that you met the first time but the spark the thing that drew you together is still there yeah the other thing that's interesting is people sometimes say well do you get along with your wife all the time and i say i don't get along with myself all the time how am i going to get along with her all the time <laughs> come on 
So I, I think what you said was right. Uh, the spark, it's different. It's not a spark like the fireworks. It's it's um, a maturity. I mean, it's funny you said that because the other night I sat down with my wife and we were having a drink and I said, you know, I was thinking about something I want to tell you. She said, what? And I said, when we first got together, we were kind of like rough. We were diamonds in the rough, okay? We both had some sort of background, ethnic background and all that, but we were rough. We, we didn't have a lot of culture. We hadn't traveled a lot and all that, but over the years of traveling, we've, we've matured, we've cultured ourselves, we've learned different cultures and love experiencing all of that. And I said, and you've turned into this beautifully dressed, beautifully confident woman that I just, I thank God every day I look at you. And she said, oh. So that's, you know, look, a, a woman said to me one night in a bar, she goes, oh, I wish I could meet a man like you. I said, let me tell you something. If you met me when I was growing up, you'd run for the hills. <laughs> this this is a result of being with a woman that was patient enough to, to pull out what she saw in me and vice versa. So we encouraged each other creatively, uh, spiritually, and just marriage-wise. I love that. You're bringing the best out of one another. You'd mentioned uh, during the top of our conversation, you talked about losing your faith. And uh, did that come back? And to what extent, your faith in God particularly, did that come back? And, and what does it look like now? Well, I can't claim that there's a God because I've never met the guy. Okay. Uh, I will say that there are things out there I don't understand. And there's certainly higher evolved beings that I'll never understand. And one night, many nights I was praying that I, I wish I could find a way back to Jesus and try to get it, not to become a Bible thumper in any way or go out and start preaching you know, the Bible and stuff. And one night in the middle of the night, I, I opened my eyes and it looked like there was a fire going on next to my bed. And, and I rubbed my eyes and it went away. And I thought, that was kind of strange. And then all of a sudden, this image of somebody in a robe was standing next to my bed. And I put out my hand and a hand touched it. And I knew in my heart, it was Jesus. And it was kind of like, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, you know, you've been lost a while, but we haven't been forgotten. And he's never come back to me. But for some reason, that kind of reinstated that there is something there. Now, you can call it Allah, you can call it Muhammad, you can call it anything, Muktananda, whatever you want to call it. There is a spiritual part of life. And it's a shame that the world has put so many labels on it that we can't just come up with a word that encompasses everybody's belief so that we're not fighting over your God's better than my God. My God's the only God, you know, Krishna is this and you know, Allah is that and Jesus is this. And it's got to find a way to bring it back to reality, which is we don't know, but let's be good brothers and sisters to each other and take care of the earth. That's kind of my feeling about getting back to it. I agree with you to a large extent. I think at the end of the day, people have sort of lost the whole being good to each other part. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and it boggles my mind because it's like, you can't be this high and mighty and then treat other people like shit. Because the golden rule is do unto others as you would have, you know, as you and would do have unto done to yourself. Right. Absolutely. So that's the thing that should be tattooed inside your head. Every decision you make, everything you do should be like, okay treat other people the way I would like to be treated in this situation. And to me, the people that are the most holy, most high and mighty, or pretend to be the most, you know, are the people that treat people least yeah. like, you know, they should be treating themselves. Or, you know, if that is how they treat themselves, then they've got a whole other set of problems that I can't help out. And I don't want to know about I don't want to know them. I really don't. I'm, I'm at a point in my life where if you're negative, bye-bye. Right. I'll pray for you, but I don't want to be around it. Right. How does that correspond with being in the industry that you're in? Because you've got to see and experience so many different types of people and a lot of entitlement. Yeah. Well, I, I learned at a very early stage in my career that if I started to confront all of those demons, I'd be quickly thrown out of the industry. So I kept my eye on the ball, which is I'm here to do a job. I know what my function is. I'm going to do that. And I'm not going to get involved in anybody's personality. And at the end of the day, if the check cleared, I'm happy, you know? So it's funny what you said about that, because when I had my company, every shoot I was on, 
I would always find one person who wanted to get in the industry and bring them in as a production assistant. And then I would go out in the street during a break and find a homeless person and say, do you want to work or are you just a drunk? And say, no, I, I'm just really down on my luck. I, I really want to work. I said, show up at seven o'clock tomorrow. I'm going to give you a job. I'm going to pay a hundred bucks a day cash. He said, a hundred dollars? I said, yeah, a hundred dollars cash a day. Every day you show up and you work for the day, at the end of the day, you'll get the money. And so the first day guy shows up at seven. I said, would you mind cleaning? He said, I'll do whatever you want. So he kept the set clean. And at the end of the day, I gave him the hundred bucks and he's looking over at the craft service table. And I said, are you hungry? He says, no, I've been eating. I'm just wondering what you're going to do with all the leftover. I said, well, usually they throw it out. Would you have a reason for it? He goes, I got a lot of friends. Take it. So we put big bags together every night and he took it and he would come back the next morning and say, there are a lot of people praying for you. And I said, I'm glad that that worked out. So, you know, if I was down on my luck, I wish somebody would help me. Right on. So what's the next stage for John Callis? What's the next chapter in your book? Avoid getting dirt thrown on me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, I feel like that's an ongoing chapter in all of our I guess for me, the joy of writing. I'm writing right now a book called The Myth, and it's all about how we got here. You know, the concept of the mythology, like they really did exist, and they just got phased out because of evil scientists. So, you know, I made it into a nice adventure, too. So I'm going to continue doing that. I can't stop working. It's just not in my DNA. I love what I'm doing. It's not a nine to five job. It's really all day long. I mean, Saturday, Sunday, I'm working away and my friends say, do you ever take a break? I said, yeah, why? And then they get emails at four o'clock in the morning. Said, do you ever sleep? I said, it's overrated. <laughs> I said, my grandfather taught me. I told, went to him and said, I'm really exhausted. He goes, keep working. When you die, you'll sleep plenty. And I've never <laughs> forgotten that tidbit of wisdom. So for me to answer your question about this book is that the chapter ends, the book ends because I've come to a realization of who I am. So what I'm going to continue to do is promote love and not hatred. I'm going to try, not going to not try. I will continue to be an example of what that means. I will desperately try not in getting into political arguments, which I'm, I always get trapped into. And then I start up on Facebook and stuff. And then the next morning I go on and go, what was I doing? <laughs> It's like arguing with a brick wall. You know, everyone's got their opinion and some on certain sides of the fence, you're never gonna convince and they're not gonna convince you. So what do you do with that information? You're kind of stuck and you think, okay, just don't acknowledge it. You know, don't take that into your body because you're gonna walk around with all this anger in you because that person didn't get what you were saying. At some point you have to realize they never will. And reverses, they're gonna say, they never will too. So <clears throat> just move on. Right. But or, occasionally I get yeah. sucked in. Yeah. Or you're going to make these points and have these arguments and the other person, it's not going to penetrate and they're just going to be walking around like nothing. And you're the one that has to carry all of the frustration and anger of not being able to convince somebody of your point. Well, it's like trying to convince somebody that your God's better than their God. Right. I mean, right. So we, you move on, you be brothers and sisters to each other. And you, you just keep building the base, you know, teach your children the right things, you know. You, prejudice is taught. It's not something you're born with. So we've got to find ways to educate parents in not teaching people racism and prejudice and hatred. And try. look, I understand when, when you're in a low income situation and the only thing you have is time to put food on the table. You don't have time for philosophy and, you know, let's be brothers and sisters. And kind. They're, they're struggling to maintain life. And those are the people that really need the help. And that's what we have to get to. You know, we have to get to those people and help them, not give them a handout, but give them opportunities to make their lives better and feel good about themselves. And that's a big challenge for the planet. Yep, I agree, I agree. You know, I'm so comfortable with you. I feel like we've been friends for years. I, I could talk with that's, you all day. That's awesome. I love to hear that. I really, really appreciate John taking time out of his busy schedule to sit down and talk. And I also appreciate that he took the time to share significant life experience and wisdom. You can get a copy of his memoir, When the Rain Stops, anywhere books are sold, including Amazon.com. Tis the season, so uh, if you have somebody special in your life that you think would benefit from that book, get it for them. 
feel free to go to johncallis.com to find out more about John's story and make sure you follow him on Instagram at John P. Callis. Hey y'all, it's me again. Just reminding you to please smash that subscribe button if you want to keep listening to this show. Leave a comment, rate us, whatever you can to push us up in the rankings. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, if you love the podcast, if you would like to be on the podcast, if you know somebody who is interested in being on the podcast or who would be a good fit to talk about masculinity, please feel free to reach out to me via my social media channels. I am on Instagram as DetoxPodGuy, and I am on Twitter at TizMikeJoseph. You can even drop me an email old school style, DetoxPod at gmail.com. By the way, not hating on anybody who still sends emails. I am old school proudly, and I send emails all the time. Uh, Detoxicity is produced and hosted by myself, Mike Joseph. Uh, The music for this podcast was written, composed, and performed by Calvin Williams. The logo for this show was designed by uh, Jacob Block. And I want to give a special shout out to Andrew Grossman and Jeff Giles for the inspiration to create this podcast. Uh, I thank you all for listening and hope that you're all keeping yourselves and each other safe out there. Take care. Peace.